We're going to be in Acts chapter 10. Uh, which I will read out in just a moment, and I think it will come up on the screen as well if you don't have a Bible with you. Okay, so Acts chapter 10, um, the first kind of half of the chapter. Here we go. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now, send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, As they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry, wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision... The men, sent by Cornelius, found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we've come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. Quite a remarkable account of of God on the move. Um, We've seen that so many times throughout the book of Acts. We we started by, by observing the The first disciples staying in Jerusalem, 120 of them in an upper room, praying and waiting uh, for what God had promised. Jesus had said, I'll send the Holy Spirit. You'll have power to witness. They wait for that moment. They receive the Spirit and they receive the power that he brings. And from there, just God's on the move through them. First of all, in Jerusalem and people here. Uh, and respond to the gospel, many of them anyway. And then we saw from chapter 8 onwards, the focus changes from just God at work in Jerusalem to now God's people scattered um, throughout the Middle East and the Mediterranean, God's people scattered by persecution, 
Um, and then God on the move in different places. And we kind of get a flavor of that by lots of different stories that have happened that we've seen in the last couple of chapters. Something about what happens here between Cornelius and Peter is so important, we basically get told the story twice. In chapter 10 and in chapter 11 as well. So with this one, we're going to have a few bites of the cherry. Uh, over the next the next few weeks to see why it's so wonderful to see why it's so uh, significant you know sometimes we can think that our part to play in God's kingdom is to try and kind of drag God lure God into what we might be doing and what we think is a good idea uh, you know we're allowed to come up with ideas um, but we can get into that way of thinking as though there's a God who's kind of interested but might be a bit distant we're the ones on the ground we better try and make things happen can we persuade God can we can we drag God into some activity that the church is involved in here on planet earth I think the book of Acts is written to have us turn that around completely not can we drag God into what we're doing but this is God drawing his church look at what God is doing. It's like God is saying to us, look at what I'm about. Look at the sorts of things that I'm doing, that I'm involved with. And church, this is what you're called for. Maybe even 30, 40 years after the Spirit coming in Pentecost, and lots of these events have happened that the book of Acts records, Luke was aware. Okay, maybe the church is starting to go a bit soft. And by writing this book called Acts, I want to stir the church up to see the sorts of things that God does and call God's people to kind of get involved with what he is uh, doing. So we see that the church, the church is scattered by persecution. That wasn't their design, but God was in it because God was going to use that to bring about a spread of the good news. And then we see in this story, we see these two guys, Cornelius and Peter. Do you notice how, first of all, they both have a vision. It starts with God. God comes to them. God comes to Cornelius and God comes to Peter the next day. Gives them a vision. Speaks to them in that vision. And that calls for a response on both their parts. And so they go on a journey. Well, actually with Cornelius, he sends some servants on a journey, but it kind of achieves the same thing. They've got to choose to follow God's direction. They do that. And when that journey comes to completion, they actually receive a warm welcome. Those three servants are warmly received by Peter. And then Peter, when he does his journey to go find Cornelius, his household, he gets that warm uh, welcome as well. See, God on the move. God on the move in, in, in amazing ways. Perhaps reading the Bible, for God to work through dreams and visions, isn't that unusual? I wonder what your own experience might be in that, of just God at work in unusual ways. We had a situation um, about this time last year when uh, a long-lost friend of Rachel's sent us an email. Rachel and this friend had not been in touch for 20 years, but the friend got in touch and said, this is a bit strange. I hope you're doing well. Lots of nice pleasantries. Um, I had a dream about you, and I woke up from the dream praying for you and your family. We're like, wow, that's amazing. She went on to say, I think God's got a relocation for you. And she spoke about um, some of the reasons in God why that was the case. This is February last year. We were like, well, it's so nice to hear from you. That means nothing to us. <laughs> but just kind of logged it later on as the year unfolds we realize we need to move not very far as it turns out um, but we, re we just recognize we needed to move and having a f having an email from a long lost friend like five or six months earlier helped us to see I think first world problems and all that I think God's in this I think this is not just there's something of God's kingdom about this, and we should, we should move. Uh, it wasn't part of the plan, but we recognize, okay, well, God's at work in that. God can be at work uh, in other 
even more remarkable ways, really. I was, I was looking up occasions where um, God reveals himself to people in dreams, people who don't yet know even who Jesus is. And um, I'm just going to read out one example I read this week. A guy called Darren Carlson, a Christian. Uh, you could find this story on the Gospel Coalition website. I think he spent some time in a refugee camp in Athens and spoke, met lots of people and, and heard a variety of stories of how God had met people uh, in this situation. He, he tells this, a friend of mine tells of a Persian migrant who arrived at the refugee centre at six o'clock in the morning, visibly upset. He told his story uh, to a Persian pastor. During the night, he saw someone dressed in white raise his hand and say, stand up and follow me. The Persian man said, who are you? The man in white replied, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the way to heaven. No one can go to the Father except through me. Does that sound, does that sound just the faintest bit familiar? Um, he began to ask the Persian pastor, who is he? What am I going to do? Why did he ask me to follow him? How shall I go? Tell me. In response, the pastor held out his Bible and asked, have you seen this before? No, he replied. Do you know what it is? No. The pastor then opened to the book of Revelation. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The man started crying and said, how can I accept him? How can I follow him? So the pastor led him in prayer and peace came over him. The pastor then gave the man a Bible and told him to hide it since the Muslims in the camp could cause him trouble. But the man replied, the Jesus that I met today, he's more powerful than the Muslims in the camp. He left and an hour later returned with, returned with 10 more Persians and told the pastor, these people want a Bible. No one had to teach him an evangelistic strategy. It's just an amazing account. That's from, that was from 2018 or thereabouts. So you know, not the most current story you'll ever hear, but not that long ago um, either. This is just to help remind us that God is on the move. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm just going to tell you a few things from this story. I think it reminds us about God's mission. And then I'm going to suggest a, a, a variety of simple ways, almost like a, a menu of options, a variety of simple things that we could choose to do this week uh, in response to believing that God's powerfully at work and has good news that he wants to bring into people's lives. The first thing is this. I think this, this story shows us that this is true. Sin is a massive problem. Sin is a massive problem. You might think, well, okay, where, where in the passage are you seeing that? And it's intrig intriguing, really, because this guy, Cornelius, is just described, did you notice this? In the most glowing terms. Just listen to some of the ways in which we're introduced. Uh, he and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. We even find out later that one of the soldiers he sends on an errand is devout. So here is a, a Roman soldier um, living life in a very kind of Roman way. By this time, maybe he's even, he's made it, he's settled down, he's relaxed into retirement or something. Who, who, who knows? Uh, but here he is, and he is already demonstrating some of the hallmarks of discipleship. You could go back through what we've looked at so far in the book of Acts and see when God's people pray. And you can see how on different occasions God's people are caused to give generously. And we, so we could see if this guy, well, he's doing really, really well. We might even ask ourselves, well, does that mean that he is He's earned favour with God. You know, if we pray enough, if we show enough devotion, maybe that's how we receive forgiveness. That's how we get saved. We could, we could ponder that. Or we could just simply ask, well, 
Why does God even need to intervene in his life in the first place? He's, if, if God's just trying to modify our behavior, if God's just trying to get us to pray a bit, if God's just trying to get us to be a bit generous, then surely he's already re achieved that with Cornelius. Why not go to someone else? And if we think in those terms, it demonstrates we don't recognize how serious the problem of sin really is. I need a, uh, a volunteer at this point. I'd like to have a jumping competition. Uh, to make it fair, it needs to be a guy, and you need to be around the age of 42. Uh, I will allow you, as you come up to the stage, to conduct your own risk assessment. And what we're going to see is between the two of us, you and I, who can jump the highest? A standing start, okay? Pete, you've already started to move. You might as well come. You can now, you know, don't place any bets, but um, who thinks Pete's going to win? <laughs> who thinks I'm going to win? Yeah. I have not practiced this at all. This is not road tested in the slightest. The podium, you realise at this point, does feel a little bit small, doesn't it? Okay, do you want to just have a few practice runs? Yeah, okay. Standing, standing jump. How high can you get your feet off the ground? Okay? Yeah? All right. So, we're now going to have the competition. And we need, we need you to judge somehow or another who you think has jumped the highest. I'm trying to win. Okay? They're all biased. All right. Okay, can I have a countdown? Three, two, one, please. Three, two, one. Oh. Do we need to do, is it like best of three? Yeah. We could just do this all morning, couldn't we? Anyone else? Any other challenges? Right, hang on a second. We'll do it again, okay? Three, two, one. One Pete, one Dan. <laughs> okay, here we go. Are you ready? Uh, count down here, please. Do I, do I hear it for Pete? Yeah. What about me? Yeah. Make, make of that what you will. Thank you so much, Pete. If they... <laughs> that title of the sermon, The One Where Two Men Jump. What was the point? No one remembers. Um, the point is this. If, if Pete and I just measure how able we are to jump against each other, Someone might be slightly better than somebody else. Okay, if, if we measure ourselves up against Cornelius, we might be like, oh, wow. He's not even yet a proper believer, and he's better than me. <laughs> we can sometimes look at each other and think, well, they're clearly, you know, God's all over them. And, and we can start to think that perhaps that's the way of coming before God. I need to do, I need to try a bit harder. I, I need to do a bit better. I need to be a bit more devoted. I'm going to explain in a moment. Look, if... if Pete and I got back up here, you've now seen the quality and height of our jumping, okay? Which one of us has a greater chance of literally, from a standing start, from the Jubilee Center, this morning, jumping over, literally, jumping over the moon? Yeah? Yeah, Pete, Pete's confident for some reason. <laughs> Well, you know, it makes no difference whether I was fractionally above Pete or Pete was fractionally above me. Gravity, very quickly, sucks us both back down to ground. However good we did, we still you know, got maybe a, our feet were just a couple of feet off the ground. Neither of us can make up some impossible distance. Did you remember uh, uh, Steve read out a passage earlier on, I think from Colossians, describing how once we were alienated, far away, separate from God. Peter, when he preaches, will sometimes use other, other words, like you know, about corruption, the corruption of the world. He's not just talking about people who misuse money. He's saying this whole world is corrupt. Every person is kind of born into this corruption. There's no, there's no remedy that we can generate ourselves. 
That is the problem of sin. Paul will talk about it in this way, in Romans chapter 3. And um, I'll just read from ver the, the phrase in, in verse 23. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. From the beginning of the, of the sentence, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is there's no difference between raised a Christian and raised a Muslim. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no difference between Pete and Dan. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin is massive. And this demonstrate this story that we're looking at today demonstrates even Cornelius needs delivering and rescuing from sin. What else does it show us? It shows us that Jesus, not only is sin a massive problem, Jesus is the only saviour. The problem of sin is not overcome by good works or good intentions. Cornelius and his household needed to hear about Jesus. And um, this is stealing from the next person's passage, really. But if you just go ahead to verse 42 and 43 in Acts chapter 10. As Peter is explaining, he said, he, he's speaking about Jesus. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the, own, he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Forgiveness of sins only comes through the name of Jesus. Do you remember when we were looking at that phrase? Uh, Peter preached on the day of Pentecost in chapter 2. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And he goes on to unpack that. What does it mean for everyone to call upon the name of the Lord? Well, it, it means for us, it means repenting and being baptised. Which Lord are we calling on? We're only calling on Jesus, the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. Sometimes, into the thinking of well-meaning Christians, when we meet people who like are, are devout, believe that there is one God, who demonstrate by the way that they live that they're concerned for other people, they're not just concerned about themselves, so they're generous and they're hospitable, we can start to think, well, maybe they don't need Jesus. Maybe there's some other path. We could st people can make statements about God's kind of the mysteries of God um, and, and an extent of his love. And then start to think, well, perhaps they don't. It doesn't need to explicitly be in the name of Jesus. It does. There's only one savior for the whole world. And his name is Jesus. Now what this also shows us, sin is a massive problem. Jesus is the only saviour. This also shows us, God is eager to save. Just consider for a moment the incredible lengths that God himself has gone to to get Cornelius and Peter together. I mean, the, the detail is amazing. Peter must already have had his plans and ideas for how he was going to spend his time um, uh, whilst he was there staying at Simon's house in Joppa, having just uh, seen Dorcas raised from the dead and having journeyed from Jerusalem. Maybe he thinks, I'll, I'll stick around for a little while. I'll see if I can be an encouragement to the other believers. Uh, and, I, and I guess he had a plan for how he used that time. God's plan was to make sure at noon, on a particular day, he was really hungry when he started to pray. And God gives him this, this vision of the, of the sheep coming down with the animals on it. Because God's wanting to get his attention, because God's wanting to take him on a new journey. Your role, Peter, is not just to encourage Christians. It'd be easy to think like that. People have scattered gone to all sorts of different places. We're told that the apostles stayed in Jerusalem 
And maybe this is the kind of thing that happened. They would they'd kind of stay in touch with different groups that had spread to different places. Maybe they had a bit of a, a kind of coordinating role. They're giving themselves to the ministry of the word and to prayer. Maybe occasionally, like Peter, then going on a journey, visiting one place or another. And it'd be easy to think, the needs of the community now are for me to kind of be that figurehead, to help organise, to help relate, and basically to focus on encouraging Christians. But even the Apostle Peter, he could be thinking, other people are called to that front line. I've, I've got other responsibilities. God knows about those big responsibilities. And God's like, Peter, go get on the front line again. I've got someone I want you to meet. Think of it this way, that for, for some reason, Cornelius decides to, to send uh, three of his people on that journey to go and find Peter. So that in the dream, he makes sure that the, the, the vision for Peter plays out three times. And he's still thinking and pondering in his hungry condition the possible meaning of the dream when he hears the guys have arrived and are looking for him. Even then, even having had the vision, we're still told, when he come round from the vision, it was the Holy Spirit who said, go with them. Can you see how eager God is to take the initiative and to see people uh, hear the gospel? Peter would write later on uh, in 2 Peter, perhaps to Christians who are starting to think, uh, why is it taking such a long time for Jesus to return? I mean, there's patience and there's extreme, what's going, why, why are we having to wait so long? And he'll write, write to them and say in 2 Peter 3 verse 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God's eagerness to save is beyond our full understanding. Just as we can sometimes think we've got to persuade God into what we're doing, we can also sometimes think that perhaps God isn't as eager as we are. Now, God is really eager. Think about the story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 15. As a picture of God's eagerness to save, he told the parable of the lost sheep. Uh, at a time when tax collectors and sinners were gathering to Jesus and Pharisees and teachers of the law were, were muttering, it says, Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me! I've found my lost sheep! I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent or perhaps don't think they need to repent. God's desire and eagerness to save is massive and is beyond what we can fully understand. And it has not decreased over time. So then we also know from this story that God is actively preparing people to be saved even right now as we speak. You know, we could ponder that in some respects Cornelius maybe in some material way had everything he thought he wanted. There's some possibility that he may have started life as a slave, but then somehow gained his freedom, become a soldier for, this, for the Roman Empire, worked his way up. He's a centurion now. Maybe he's retired and living the life of Riley, a basic life of, 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 of comfort, of respect. He's got everything he could need. But all the way through, as he spends time in this strange land 
where people believe there's one God, he finds himself drawn. He finds himself attracted. And maybe, therefore, he finds himself dissatisfied with the life he's known so far. He's got everything he wants, all by virtue of living in this empire, where as long as you say, Caesar is Lord, your life will, could work out quite smoothly, thank you. But he realises it's hollow, it's empty. Listen to what Peter will say again uh, in his, uh, his first letter, or the first letter that we have that he wrote. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Do you see that phrase? What, what have we been redeemed from? What have we been rescued from? Peter describes it as an empty way of life that's been handed down to you. That is what Cornelius has come to recognise. As much as I might have or, or, or not have, there's an, there's an emptiness here. For us in our society, that's no longer... Um, comes by saying, Caesar is Lord. If you like, the empire in which we live has the motto, the individual. The individual is Lord. The God's people, their, their civilization, their culture was built on Ten Commandments. And for society now, it's probably, I've heard it suggested that it's built on three taboos. Three things. Don't do anything to harm somebody. Whatever you want to do with somebody else, make sure you get their consent. And whatever you do, don't criticize someone else's life choices. Those are the, the three taboos, someone has suggested, around which our society is built. There comes a point for just recognising, and this is what God is doing, he will be bringing many people to realise that's an, it's a, it's an empty way of life. This doesn't open up the opportunity to really flourish, as the promises and the adverts might suggest. There's got to be something more, there's got to be something else. An empty way of life. God is preparing people by having them realise the emptiness of life without him. Maybe, like Cornelius, there are some here in the room, right across the age spectrum, and that's what's happening for you right now. Just recognising the, the emptiness of life without God. And if God is actively preparing people to be saved, then what this is showing us as well is that God is looking for his church uh, to get involved, to step into a new adventure like Peter. Not just to think of ourselves as those who might be part of a church, and I think my part to play is encouraging other Christians. Of course it is. Of course it is. But this is what we're being drawn into. And sometimes we might be great at making our plans and knowing what we think the next week involves. But perhaps God wants to interrupt. It's not to say every plan is a bad idea. It's to say God looks to interrupt his people and grab our attention. And to have us pray, not Lord, not just give me everything I need for today, Lord. Please be involved in all the plans that I've already made and are fairly set. I've put them in my diary. I can't change them now. Um, to God, I want to be open to what you're doing. So here are five things I think we could choose to do this week. They're simple. They're not rocket science. But I wonder if God might just be stirring us. And these may be helpful. This will be fairly rapid. Number one. Pay attention to the unexpected. Is God getting your attention in some way? That might not just be through some vision or dream. 
But is there something God is doing that's interrupting your normal routines to whisper to you, I've got a new adventure, come and get involved? Number two, what do you do when someone asks about your weekend? When someone asks you about your weekend, you could say, I heard an amazing story about a Persian man who met Jesus in a dream. I just see where the conversation goes. You could, thirdly, do something kind for a neighbour or colleague for no obvious reason whatsoever. With this one, I can't help but think about cake. I know there are other ways to show kindness. <laughs> Bake that cake in the name of Jesus, knock on that door and say, here you go, I made this for you. See what it prompts. Oh, they ask you why. I don't know if it's helpful. My church leader suggested it. <laughs> Fourth, think about someone who doesn't know Jesus yet. And you, you probably get to spend time with that person most weeks. Maybe not every day. Pray for that person every day this week. Pray for them. Pray for what they might be going through. Pray for yourself. To show the, the love and care of God in some way. See what happens. If something encouraging happens off the back of any of these, do you know what you can also do? You can just come and let us know. And that way we get to encourage each other. Even if the conversation doesn't go that well, we will celebrate with you that you were courageous in one of these ways. The fifth thing, tell that person that you've been praying for that you've been praying for them. And is there anything you'd like, is there anything they would like you to know about as you pray in the name of Jesus? I know those aren't rocket science, but if we're encouraged that God is on the move, let's go and expect to discover that he is about a great work this week, in this city, in our time, through our lives, in Jesus' name.